2009, roughly. Uh, he said, uh, he said, there's now a great chance for peace. We ought to move forward for peace and you know, a peace process. He says, there's a constructive plan on the table, you know, the Arab peace plan. He said, finally, the Arabs have come along with the plan, actually. They came along with it in 1976. Ago, but, uh, but now the Arabs have come along with the plan. Uh, and their plan calls for normalization of relations with Israel. And he called on the Arab states to move forward with their plan and normalize relations with Israel. You know, Obama is an intelligent, literate person who can read, read and so on. Uh, he knows perfectly well that that's not what the plan said. The plan reiterated the international consensus on a two-state settlement and went even beyond it. It said, once that's established, we should move on to normalize relations with Israel. Well, Obama omitted, carefully omitted, the guts of the plan and said normalize relations with Israel. Now, that's his way of telling the world we're not going to do anything. Uh, we're going to block peace, which is exactly what it meant and exactly what happened. Uh, settlement expansion continued. Uh, Obama claimed to be opposed to it, but he made it very clear to Israel that the opposition didn't mean anything. He was asked to people were asked at press conferences, are you going to do anything if Israel violates your uh, demand to end the settlement expansion? He said, no, this is just symbolic. In other words, Mr. Netanyahu, go ahead and do whatever you like. Uh, uh, he was asked specifically, are you going to do what the first George Bush did? The first George Bush did impose very mild sanctions when, if Israel violated its demand that they not expect <coughs> sanctions. Uh, but Bush said, the Bush spoke, the Obama spoke and said explicitly, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do what Bush did, just symbolic. So it's a clear statement, go ahead and expand the settlements, which is exactly how it's understood. Now, meanwhile, uh, George Mitchell was kind of displaced by Dennis Ross. The Ross comes straight out of APAC. He's a uh, Clinton's negotiator. His position, as he says, is now, there's an asymmetry between Israel and Palestine. Uh, Israel, Israel has needs, but Palestine only has wants, so therefore we can dismiss them. That's the neutral negotiator. He's now the leading advisor. Uh, and then comes the series of steps up to the veto of the UN resolution uh, last February. <laughs> the Arab League, meanwhile, they do talk, they actually have voices. Uh, they uh, don't say much, but they say something. Like a couple of months ago, they, they called for two no-fly zones. You heard about one of them. They called for a no-fly zone in Libya. And they got to about that great no-fly zone in Libya. We got a bomb in Libya because the Arabs demanded. Uh, they also, at the same time, called for a no-fly zone over Gaza. Not over. Actually, you can read about it. You can read about it in the London Financial Times, the main international business journal. Uh, some around the corners in the United States, you can read about it, but no national press. Uh, that no fly zone over Gaza didn't conform to U.S. policies, so therefore that one didn't exist. Uh, the, uh, let's go on to what the options are now. Uh, what are the options today? Well, and there's a lot of commentary about this, of course, and the way it's usually phrased is that there are really two options. And one is the two-state settlement, which has been the international consensus for 35 years. You know, you can argue about this in that detail, the base framework of is understood. Now, that's one. And the other option that's proposed is that uh, Israel should take it all over, take over the whole territory, and then... Uh, There'll be a civil rights struggle, like kind of an anti-apartheid struggle. And then actually, that's a position which is argued for by a lot of supporters of the Palestinians. They said that'd be even better than two states. It's not going to have an anti-apartheid struggle. And that's a real delusion. But those are not the two options. Uh, there's a third option. The third option is that Israel and the U.S. will continue doing exactly what they're doing right now. What they're doing right now is implementing a version of what used to be called the Sharon Plan. General Sharon, the big expansion is. And then Israel takes what it wants in West Bank. And we know what it wants, not a secret. It wants everything behind the separation wall, which is in fact an annexation wall. Now that's arable land, uh, uh, water resources, uh, the nice suburbs of the uh, <coughs> Highway system connecting them and so on. So they'll take that. They'll take what's 
called Jerusalem, which is far bigger than anything that was ever called Jerusalem. They've illegally expanded Jerusalem, illegally annexed it with security council orders. So they'll take Jerusalem, which cuts out a big piece of the West Bank, and they'll take the Jordan Valley, from which Palestinians are being mostly evicted, and settlements are being set up. Now that imprisons what's left. It's separated from Gaza, so no outlet to the sea or anything like that. And then they're cutting the corridors through what's left, the big corridor that goes east of Greater Jerusalem, that's almost to Jericho, essentially, bisects the West Bank, the big town, not that it was even being built there, mostly under Clinton, but it started in the 70s. Another corridor up north that goes through Ariel, another town, and another one above that goes through Dumim, still another town. It essentially breaks the remaining parts of the West Bank up into almost non-contiguous and unviable cantons, the big infrastructure projects, so that Israelis and American visitors can drive through the whole area, never even seeing a Palestinian, maybe some figure on a hill, a little goat or something, or a tourist office probably, comes and looks good. But that's it, and the Palestinians can just rock. Not entirely, so like in Ramallah, the U.S. and, as a matter of fact, Europe, Europe mainly, are funding a kind of an island of affluence. So you live in Ramallah, you have nice restaurants, concerts, and so on. That's the standard neo-colonial program. If you go to any third world country, any miserable colony, you can find islands of affluence and glamour and so on, beyond what we have. That's for the elites, and that shuts them up. And meanwhile, the rest just collapses. They can leave if they want. Well, that's the third option, and that's the one that's being implemented. So we don't have to speculate about it. It's being implemented, you're paying for it, or your parents, if you're not old enough to pay taxes. And that's what's going on before our eyes. So that's the real option. And the choice is that of two states. There is no third option at this point. You can think in the longer term, maybe down the road there'll be something better, but it's got to be a first step, and the first step is two states. There's no other proposal. It's now argued very commonly that that's impossible, because settlements have gone so far that it's impossible. Well, the world doesn't agree. That's why you had the February resolution. The world thinks it's possible. The Palestinians think it's possible, both factions, Fatah and Hamas, which again reiterated its support for it. So I think there's reason to believe it is possible. What's crucial is, as always, what the U.S. will do. If the U.S. acts, if the U.S. joins the world, it will be possible, and Israel will go along, because they don't have choices. And we can do things about it, like we can stop participating in the crimes. It's not a major, unimaginable action. Stop participating in the crimes, along with what, say, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International and others are calling for. That would make a difference. Now, there's a lot of, it's very common now these days to draw analogies between Israel and South Africa. And most of them are pretty dubious, in my view, but there are some which are reasonable and instructive. Oh, okay. Five minutes. I'm used to that. When my kids were little, they asked questions. They often said, just the five-minute lecture. There's one analogy between Israel and South Africa, which is very real, and never discussed, probably because it's real. In around 1960, the South African government, the nationalist government, they recognized that they're becoming an international pariah. And the South African foreign minister called in the American government to 
close to us and so on. But uh, you and I both know that there's only one vote in the UN. You're not. And so as long as you're with us, we don't really care what the rest of the world thinks. And that's pretty much what happened. If you look through the following decades, and by the 19th, a big anti-apartheid movement did develop. By around 1980, uh, American corporations were pulling out. Uh, the Congress was passing sanctions. Uh, the UN had already declared an embargo. Uh, uh, nobody was supporting apartheid. It was overwhelming opposition. But the only person who was supporting apartheid was Ronald Reagan and his administration. They were strong supporters of apartheid. And they continued to support it in the framework of what they of the war on terror. The war on terror was declared by Reagan and Bush, and uh, uh, they had to defend uh, the African nationalist uh, apartheid regime against uh, uh, the terrorist uh, Nelson Mandela and the uh, African National Congress. And immediately, in 1988, uh, the White House uh, declared the ANC, Mandela's ANC, to be uh, one of the more notorious terrorist groups in the world. So, of course, we had to support the white nationalist regime. In fact, Mandela himself only got off the terrorist list about two years ago. So now wow. he come to the United States without a special, uh, special arrangement. And that continued until around 1990. At that point, U.S. policy changed. You know, have all the documents, but you can guess why. Uh, Mandela was let out of Robbins Island. A couple of years later, apartheid was gone. Uh, it, it's not a nice situation, or a rotten situation in many ways, but at least apartheid was dismantled, which is a big victory. Now, that's not the only time that that's happened. That's case after case. Uh, when the boss lays down the law, people have to do something. And uh, that's, uh, you know, that's uh, actually an optimistic uh, conclusion for us. It means that it's really very much in our hands. Uh, if uh, we take the right kinds of actions, if we're capable of, uh, if our own society is democratic enough so that popular opinion makes a difference, which it should be, and if it isn't, we have a lot to worry about, not just this, uh, then uh, plenty of things we can do to change that, to compel the United States to join the world on this issue as well as others. Uh, and in that case, this. Uh, Israel-Palestine, the conflict can be you know, certainly mitigated, not solved, but mitigated and laid, set on the basis to a, a much more favorable outcome. That's the fact that it